हेलो माय डियर स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज महमूद शेख आई एम ए प्रैक्टिसिंग चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट एंड आल्सो एन ऑडिटिंग फैकल्टी फॉर सी एंड सी स्टूडेंट्स इन दिस वीडियो आई एम गोइंग टू रिवाइज द चैप्टर व्हिच इज कंपनी ऑडिट सो एज वी ऑल आर अवेयर कंपनी ऑडिट इज सच एन इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर एज अ पार्ट ऑफ अवर सी इंटर एग्जामिनेशन एंड देर वेर ए फ्यू अटेम्प्ट इन विच द मार्क्स फ्रॉम दिस चैप्टर एलोन कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड फॉर फिफ्टीन मार्क्स ऑल्सो but in the worst case scenario also we can expect a minimum of 8 to 10 marks from this chapter called company audit so in this company in this video i will try to revise this entire chapter company audit within a very minimum amount of time possible and at the same time i will try to make sure that we are covering all the key aspects and important aspects of this chapter company audit so without any delay further let us directly jump into this chapter company audit revision so company audit as a part of this particular chapter company audit in the auditing subject we are nothing but discussing a few sections of the company's act here so that's why i say when I, when i say we are discussing the company audit chapter we are nothing but discussing a part of the law here so section 138 till section 148 of the companies act and in fact speaking from section 139 till section 148 of the companies act we are going to revise now so first let us try to start our revision from understanding with section 141 of the companies act so section 141 of the companies act is such a section of the companies act which is dealing about who is eligible and who is not eligible for getting appointed as an auditor section 141 of the companies act is going to talk about who can be appointed as an auditor who cannot be appointed as an auditor so this section 141 contains four subsection let us start with subsection 1 which is talking about qualifications who is eligible for getting appointed as an auditor of a company so the act simply says section 141 subsection says an individual can be appointed as an auditor provided he or she should be a chartered accountant having certificate of practice in simple terms we call it as practicing chartered accountant or even a firm or llp also can be appointed as auditors provided majority of the partners shall be practicing chartered accountants when i say majority it should be greater than or equal to 50% assume there is a partnership firm in which there are four total partners are there out of them two are practicing chartered accountants one is a cost accountant and one is a company secretary can this firm be appointed as an auditor no why because they are putting a condition majority in our case only two partners are practicing chartered accountants in four two is exactly 50% exactly 50% does not constitute majority in order to call it as a majority it should be greater than 50% so a firm or llp can be appointed as an auditor provided majority of the partners in that firm shall be practicing chartered accountants that's what simply section 141 subsection 1 says who is eligible now coming to section 141 subsection 2 it will be talking about signing of the auditor's report who will sign the auditor's report see when an individual is appointed no confusion the same individual will sign the audit report what if a firm or llp is appointed as an auditor if a firm or llp is appointed as an auditor not all partners will sign on behalf of the firm one partner who shall be a practicing chartered accountant shall sign on behalf of the entire firm so assume there is a firm abc and co which has been appointed as an auditor not all the partners will sign any partner who shall be a practicing chartered accountant assume that in this firm a and b are practicing chartered accountants c is a cost accountant now who can sign the audit report on behalf of this firm either a or b will sign the audit report on behalf of the entire firm and the partner whoever is signing the audit report that person we generally call him as engagement partner we call him so this is what section 141 subsection 2 says talking about signing of the audit report an individual the same individual if it is a firm or llp then any partner who is a practicing chartered accountant can sign on behalf of the entire firm coming to subsection 3 which is the most important section when it comes to examination majority of the times the question will get tested from this particular subsection 3 only so 141 subsection 3 will be talking about disqualifications when i say disqualifications what do i mean by that is who is not eligible for getting appointed as an auditor 
that means even though you are a practicing chartered accountant even though you are an audit firm or llp in which majority of partners are uh, practicing chartered accountants still if you attract any of the clauses given under section 141 subsection 3 then you will not become eligible for getting appointed as an auditor so what i am saying even though you are a practicing chartered accountant even though you are an audit firm in which majority of partners are practicing chartered accountants but still if you attract to any of the disqualifications contained in section 141 subsection 3 you will become ineligible for getting appointed as an auditor so what are that disqualifications let us have a look at it so the following persons are not eligible for getting appointed as an auditor of a company even though they possess chartered accountancy qualification even though they are chartered accountants even though they are qualified under section 141 subsection 1 but still if they attract any of the disqualifications given here any of the clauses if they get attracted they will become disqualified what are they number 1 a body corporate other than llp a body corporate can't be appointed as an auditor of a company generally who will come under body corporate definition a company will come under body corporate definition which means a company cannot be appointed as auditor of another company so assume that there are four practicing chartered accountants a b c and d four are uh, practicing chartered accountants they want to carry out the practice collectively they have incorporated a company a b c d private limited and in the name of this company they want to provide audit and taxation services can this company be appointed as auditor of another company no why because it is a what body corporate so that's the logic why we don't frequently find audit companies like the way we find audit firms why because if you are a, if you if the practicing chartered accountants incorporate their entity as a company they will lose one revenue generating area which is a what company audit so that is what the first disqualification a body corporate can't be appointed as auditor of company but they are saying other than llp which means what so if you literally look at the income uh, llp act even llp also will come under body corporate definition but even though llps will come under body corporate still they are permitted to do the company audit why because if you read the first clause they are saying a body corporate other than llp which means other than llp whatever other body corporates are there they can't be appointed as an auditor which means that llp is eligible for getting appointed as an auditor other than llp whatever other body corporates are there generally companies companies can't get appointed as auditor of another company but llp can be appointed as an auditor of a company clear that's the logic why why big four entities are able to do the audit why because all the big four entities if you observe for audit division they have incorporated themselves as llp and llps are permitted to do the audit but companies are not permitted to do the audit second one an officer or employee of a company a person who is an officer or employee in a company the same person can't be appointed as auditor in another auditor in the same company why because this will come under self review threat so in order to avoid that self review threat the act has given this disqualification an officer or employee of a company can't be appointed as auditor of another company when i say officer who will come under officer definition directors will come under de officer definition key managerial person will come under officer definition so like that if you are a officer and or employee in the company for the same company you can't act as a auditor now talking about clause c a person who is a partner or who is in employment of an officer or employee of a company a person who is a partner or who is in employment of an officer or employee of a company so what do they mean here is assume that there is a company x limited in that there is a person mr a he is an officer or employee in the company x limited who mr a so mr a is an officer or employee of a company x limited can mr a act as an auditor no mr a can't act as a auditor which clause 141 subsection 3 clause b which says an officer or employee can't be appointed as an auditor whereas assume that there is an another person mr b now what is this person mr b is he is a partner of mr a or he is an employee of mr a that means a and b are practicing chartered accountants they are having outside a firm a b and co so b is a partner of mr a or b is an employee of mr a now 141 subsection 3 clause c says that even this person mr b is also disqualified why because Mr B is a person who is a partner or who is an employee of an officer or employee of a company 
Mr. A is officer or employee, so he is disqualified because of 141 subsection 3 clause B. Now, Mr. B is also disqualified. Why? Why? Because he is a partner or he is in employment with Mr. A, who is an officer or employee of a company. Clear everybody? So, C point says a person who is a partner or who is in employment of an officer or employee of a company is also disqualified. Next one, talking about point D. A person who or his relative and one more thing in 141 subsection 3 clause D there will be three sub clauses. Let us try to quickly revise what are that three sub clauses. First we will start with sub clause 1. A person who or his relative. So let me diagrammatically present it. A person nothing but a person who is a practicing chartered accountant or his relative or his partner. Partner in the sense business partner not life partner. Life partner will come under relative definition. So what if they are doing, if they hold any security, if they hold any shares, debentures, etc. kind of investments where in the company, in the holding company, in the subsidiary company, in the associate company, in the subsidiary of holding company and then they will become disqualified. Who? A person that is a practicing chartered accountant or his relative or his business partner if they are having any security or shares where in the company for which you are doing audit, in its holding company, in its subsidiary company, in its associate company or even subsidiary of holding company, then you become disqualified. Clear? Now there are some doubts to be addressed here relative. See why basically this disqualification is to avoid that self-interest threat. Why? Because your auditor is getting benefited from, from some financial interest in the company. So now there are few points to sort out here. Sir, who will come under relative definition? So the act has not given you permission to define who is your relative, who is not your relative. The act has not given you that scope. The act is saying we are defining the term relative. That's what you have to follow. Whether you like it or not like it, these people will be coming under your relative definition. Sir, who are that people, sir, who will come under relative definition? So if you see here, they are all members of HUF. And also they are husband and wife, person and the spouse. And also one person is related to another as given below, father, mother, brother. So here if you see father, mother, brother, sister, son, including all their step relationships, daughter's wife, daughter and daughter's husband. So these people will come under relative whether you like it or don't like it. These are relatives, that's all. If any of these people are having shares in the company, then you become disqualified. Clear everybody? So this is what regarding relative definition. So, but however, for this rule, there is one exception. So the general rule says that if a practicing chartered accountant, relative or his partner, if you have any shares or securities in any of these companies, you become disqualified. Now I am saying for this rule, there is an exception. Exception means what? That means in some cases, even if you have shares, that will not make you disqualified. Sir, what is that case? Sir, that particular case is when a relative is having shares, he can hold the shares up to face value of 1 lakh rupees. How much? Up to face value of 1 lakh rupees of shares can be held by whom? Relative only. Neither the practicing chartered accountant nor partner. If a practicing chartered accountant or his partner, even if they have single share also, they will become disqualified. But a relative can hold the shares in the company or the group companies up to a face value of 1 lakh rupees. So you have to be more concerned only with this face value. Sometimes in the examination, they will give you questions like purchase price is this much, market value is this much, all these things they will give. Just ignore all that. The relative can hold share hold shares up to a face value of 1 lakh rupees. We should be concerned with only face value. What is the market price irrelevant? What is the purchase price irrelevant? All these things are irrelevant. And this exception becomes applicable only for whom? Relative, not to the practicing chartered accountant or his partner. So this is what 141 subsection 3 clause D sub clause 1. Let us try to revise now 141 subsection 3 clause D sub clause 2. Now sub clause 2 says that a person or his relative or his partner, if they have been indebted for an amount exceeding 5 lakh rupees, to the company, holding company, subsidiary company, associate company, subsidiary of holding company, then also they become disqualified. So what they are saying, either a practicing chartered accountant by myself or my relative or my partner, if any of us are indebted to the company for an amount exceeding how much? 5 lakh rupees. Then for, to whom? To the company or any of these group companies. Then what we become? We become disqualified. So does that mean we should not be indebted? No, you can become indebted. But try to make sure that the indebtedness is up to 5 lakh rupees only. You should not get indebted to the company for beyond 5 lakh rupees even by 1 rupee also. However, there are some special points here. What are that special points is 
sometimes what will happen is they will give you in the question the auditor has bought the goods from the company on credit basis so when the auditor is there he bought the company on credit basis and the total purchase value made was 6 lakh rupees and it was bought on credit basis is the auditor indebted here yes even if you buy the goods on credit basis also you will become indebted they will give extra point on the question in the question what they will say is the auditor has the company has offered the credit period to the to the auditor in the ordinary course of business like any other customer they have treated this auditor also as an ordinary customer and they have sold the goods on credit basis so it is a common practice of the company they did not give any special privilege to the auditor for everybody they will sell the goods on credit basis only this will will this make any difference on the answer no this shall not make any difference on the answer So the point which I want to conclude here is the moment if the auditor is indebted for more than five lakh rupees, you will become disqualified. Whether this indebtedness happened in the ordinary course of business or is it a special privilege given only for the auditor, all that doesn't matter. The moment you are indebted for more than five lakh rupees, that's all. You will become disqualified. And few more points like if you collect the fees on advance basis, then also you will be considered as indebted. So does that mean auditor should not take advance? No, take the advance, no problem. But try to make sure that you are taking the advance up to five lakh rupees only. Don't try to take the advance for more than five lakh rupees. And one more thing, however, if the auditor collects the fees on progressive basis, that will not make him indebted. Sir, so what is the difference between advance basis and progressive basis? Advance means without doing work, I am collecting the fees. Progressive progressive basis means I am proportionately doing the work and proportionately collecting the audit fees. Like assume the total audit fees was ten lakh rupees, I have done sixty percent of the audit and collected six lakh rupees of audit fees. So here I have proportionately done the work and proportionately I collected the audit fees. This I call it as progressive basis. So if the auditor collects the fees on progressive basis, will he be considered as indebted? The answer is no. However, if he collects the fees on advance basis, then he will be considered as indebted. Clear. So these are some special points regarding 141 subsection 3 clause D sub clause 2. Now talking about 141 subsection 3 clause D sub clause 3, very simple clause. A person being a practicing chartered accountant or his relative or his partner, if they have given any security or they have given any guarantee on behalf of some third party for an amount exceeding one lakh. to the company holding company subsidiary company associate company subsidiary of holding company then also they will become disqualified so in the previous points in the sub clause 2 they have become directly indebted but in sub clause 3 what they are saying is they did not become directly indebted this practicing chartered accountant or his relative or his partner they have given guarantee they acted as a surety or they are acted as a guarantor some third party has taken the loan from the company but my uh, but this auditor or relative or partner they are acting as what guarantor and if the amount of guarantee given is more than 1 lakh rupees then you will become disqualified so this is what section 141 sub section 3 clause d sub clause 3 says so with this four clauses we have revised clause a clause b clause c and clause d now let us talk about clause e so what does clause e say so if you have a look at clause e a person or firm a person or firm if they are having any business relationship if they are having any business relationship with the company holding company subsidiary company associate company subsidiary of holding company subsidiary of associate company also so one important point very much important for mcqs and true or false statements for the purpose of clause d group companies contains only five companies for the purpose of clause e group companies contains six companies subsidiary of associate company also will get added to the list in case of section 141 subsection 3 clause e whereas subsidiary of associate company will not form part of group companies as per section 141 subsection 3 clause d see now out of this also they can frame a question assume a true or false statement has been given uh assume that the auditor is having shares in some company x limited which is subsidiary of associate company of some y limited so is auditor eligible for getting appointed as auditor of y limited once again i am saying uh, assume that there is a person mr x he wants to get appointed as auditor of x limited however mr a is having shares in y limited and the relationship between these two companies is y limited is a subsidiary of associate company of x limited 
is the auditor qualified or disqualified auditor is qualified only he will not become disqualified why because subsidiary of associate company is not there as a part of 141 subsection 3 clause d which means you can hold the shares in the subsidiary of associate company you can become indebted for more than 5 lakh rupees in case of subsidiary of associate company you can give a guarantee on behalf of some third party for an amount exceeding 1 lakh rupees for a subsidiary of associate company whereas for the purpose of 141 subsection 3 clause e you cannot have business relationship with the subsidiary of associate company so if you have any business relationship apart from providing services of audit if you buy goods from the company or if you receive services from the company then you will become disqualified but however this rule is putting so much of a practical impact uh, so much of practical difficulties so what act has come up with is exceptions that means certain kind of business relationships are permitted see if you literally go by this rule what will happen is which means if i am conducting audit of reliance industries limited i should stop using geo sim i should stop uh, going to the reliance markets i should not i should not use any kind of reliance product if i am conducting audit of indigo airlines i should my i should stop myself from traveling in the indigo airlines so like this this rule is putting so many restrictions so that's why what act has told is certain exceptions we are giving that means some kind of business relationships you can have that will not make you disqualified sir what are that exceptions sir number 1 professional services which are permitted to be rendered both under chartered accountants act and also under companies act there are some professional services which a chartered accountant can render in addition to company audit which cannot make him disqualified sir examples of professional services sir tax audit gst audit these kind of extra relationships you can have and apart from that those business transactions which are in ordinary course of business and also which are happening at arms length price if the transaction is happening in the ordinary course of business and if the price charged is arms length price then also that will not make you disqualified like if i am conducting audit of reliance industries limited i can still use a geo sim why because for reliance ordinary course of business is what providing telecom services also so in the ordinary course of business i am receiving services i am using reliance geo sim but what should happen is whatever price an ordinary customer pays even i should also pay the same price no special discount from me no added advantages for me so like this if the transaction is in the ordinary course of business but the price charged is arms length price then also you will not become disqualified so this is the general rule if you have any business relationship that will make you disqualified however certain business relationships will not make you disqualified what kind of business relationship professional services which are permitted to be rendered under chartered accountants act and companies act and also those transactions which are in the ordinary course of business and the price should be arms length price so this is what regarding clause e now coming to clause f a person whose relative is a director or who is in the employment of the company as a director or kmp very simple clause no complications here at all like i am a chartered accountant i have some relative my relative is in is in some top level management of the company or he is some key managerial person in the company like i am a practicing chartered accountant my father is a cfo in some company don't appoint as an auditor of that company or my brother is some a director in the company don't act as auditor of that company why because very simple logic here there is a familiarity threat here so in order to avoid that familiarity threat the act has simply told if you are if your relative is some key managerial person or director in some company don't act as a auditor of that company so simple now coming to point g very important a person who is in full time employment elsewhere if i am a practicing chartered accountant but if i am having a full time employment elsewhere then i will be I'll, then i will not become eligible for doing audit of any company so i should not be a full time employee and there is one more point also a person or partner of a firm holding appointment of more than 20 company audits as on the date of proposed appointment and one more thing what they are saying is if you already have if you already have 20 company audits you are no longer eligible for accepting a new audit this limit of 20 we call it as ceiling limit which means sir can a practicing chartered accountant do any number of company audits no a practicing chartered accountant can't do any number of company audits He, there is a restriction there is a limit on maximum number of company audits which a practicing chartered accountant can do and what is that limit 20 a practicing chartered accountant can do maximum of 20 company audits only not beyond that 
Now, there are some special points regarding the ceiling limit. So what are that special points means this limit of 20 shall be counted per person who is a practicing chartered accountant. Limit of 20 shall be counted per person who is a practicing chartered accountant. Now, what does that mean? So assume there is an audit firm in which there are three partners are there who are practicing chartered accountants now how many audits this how many company audits this audit firm can do since there are three practicing chartered accountants for each practicing chartered accountant limit of 20 will be counted 3 into 20 totally 60 company audits this audit firm can do however there is an audit firm in which 10 practice uh, 10 partners are there out of them eight are practicing chartered accountants two are non practicing chartered accountants how many audits this comp this audit firm can do not 10 into 20 why because the limit will be counted per practicing chartered accountant out of this 10 only eight are practicing chartered accountants so 8 into 20 160 audits company audits this particular audit firm can do Sometimes what else even could happen is a person can act as a partner in multiple forms. Assume this individual Mr. A, he is a partner in ABC and co also. He is a partner in another firm PQR and co also. He is also a partner in another firm XYZ and co. Now since he is partner in three different firms, will he get a limit of 20 in each of the entity? No, he will not get a limit of separate separately 20. Then what will happen? So for this individual practicing chartered accountant a total limit of 20 only will be given it is his choice how he wants to allocate it among different firms like if he has already done 10 audits here how many more audits he can do in this two firms 10 only put together now assume that in the pqr audit form also he has or mr a has already signed five audit reports five company audit reports now how many more audits can be done in the name of xyz and co five only just because a person is practicing in different entities he will not get a limit of 20 everywhere he will be considered as a single practicing chartered accountant the limit of 20 only will be given it is his choice how he wants to allocate it among different firms in which he is a partner however there are certain companies which should not be counted in ceiling limit which means there are certain companies for which i can do any number of audits they will not be counted in the limit of 20 what are that companies one person company dormant companies small company and a private limited company having a paid up capital of less than 100 crores for these four kind of companies, I can do any number of audits. They will not come in my limit of 20. Apart from this, whatever other companies are there, like private limited companies having a capital of more than 100 crores, sorry, more than or equal to 100 crores, public companies, listed companies, banking companies, insurance companies. So like this, apart from these four, whatever other categories of companies are there, they will only come under the limit of 20. And the ceiling limit is concept not just there in the company audit. The similar kind of concept is there even for the tax audit also. But for tax audit, the limit is 60. For company audits, the limit is 20. But for tax audit, the limit is what? 60. So this is what regarding ceiling limit. This we have discussed it as a part of 141 subsection 3 clause G. Now let us try to understand clause H. Clause H is very simple. A person, a practicing chartered accountant who has been convicted by a court of an offense involving fraud for a period of 10 years, he cannot get appointed as an auditor of a company. So if today a court has convicted, a court has passed an order that assume today is the date, assume some 26th of uh, January. So on this date, 26th of January, some 2023, on this date, the court has passed an order that so and so person, Mr. X, practicing chartered accountant, conducted a fraud in the company. Now, from the date of this conviction, from the date of this passing of the order, until 10 years are not elapsed, from this date until 10 years, this person, Mr. X, can't get appointed as auditor of company. Not just in the company in which he has committed a fraud, he cannot get appointed as auditor of any company for the span of 10 years. This is what clause H says. So that's what I say. Committing fraud looks very fancy, but that comes with all these consequences. Also for 10 years, you will lose the power to do the company audit. Next one. Last point. Any person who directly or indirectly renders any services as specified in section 144 to the company, its holding company or its subsidiary company. Now, what is this is? As an auditor, if you want to do company audit, you should not provide certain services which are mentioned under section 144, which we call them as prohibited services. Sir, why the name prohibited services? Why? Because if you want to do company audit, you are prohibited from doing the services. 
sir what are those services sir which i am prohibited to do so there are eight services which are prescribed which an auditor is prohibited to do what are they accounting and bookkeeping services internal audit services design and implementation of financial information system actuarial services investment advisory services investment banking services outsourced financial services management services so being a practicing chartered accountant if you provide any of these eight services you will become disqualified to act as a company auditor so you can provide either company audit services or the section 144 services but not both simultaneously both can't happen at the same time either company audit services or section 144 services but not both simultaneously clear and this services, this section 144 services should not be provided to the company, even you should not provide it to its holding company, even you should not provide it to its subsidiary company. That's all. For clause D, group companies are 5. For clause E, group companies are 6. For clause I, the group companies are only 3. You should not provide section 144 services to the company, to the holding company, to the subsidiary company. Clear? So these are the disqualification if practicing chartered accountant or audit firm gets attracted to any of these disqualifications then you become disqualified you are ineligible for getting appointed as an auditor. So this is the most important concept. Now when in section 141 we are done with three subsections now the last subsection is section uh, 141 subsection 4 which is about subsequent disqualification. Now, what is the subsequent disqualification? The name itself says, at the time of appointment, you did not attract any of the disqualification. But after you are validly appointed as an auditor, then if you attracted to any of the disqualifications, what will happen, sir? At the time when I am getting appointed, I did not had any shares. But after getting appointed, I acquired the shares in the companies or group companies. What I am supposed to do? The act simply says that if it is a case of subsequent disqualification, immediately vacate the office immediately leave the office you are no longer permitted to continue as an auditor the act will not permit you immediately vacate the office however for this rule also there is one exception that's me that means in one case even though you attract subsequent disqualification you need not vacate the office immediately what is that case so that particular case is if the reason for subsequent disqualification is relatives face value of shareholding has exceeded by and exceeded by 1 lakh rupees then immediate vacation does not apply so as we know relative can hold the shares up to a face value of 1 lakh at the time when auditor is getting appointed either relative does not have shares or relative is having the shares up to a face value of 1 lakh but after getting appointed as an auditor then the relative bought some extra shares and his face value of shareholding has increased to 1 lakh General rule is what? This is a subsequent disqualification, immediately vacate. But I am saying it exception. Exception means what? In this case, you need not vacate the office immediately. Then what will happen? So, if this is the reason for disqualification, you need not vacate the office immediately. 60 days of time limit will be given for you to take corrective action. Sir, what could be corrective action? So, corrective action could be go to the relative, convince him, make him sell the shares, bring the face value up to 1 lakh rupees. If you are able to do it within 60 days, no need to vacate the office. If you are unable to do it within 60 days, then vacate the office. And this exception is available for only one case if the relative face value of shareholding exceeded 1 lakh. What if the practicing chartered accountant himself bought the shares? After getting appointed as an auditor, immediately vacate. This exception, 60 days will become only in one case if the relative's face value of shareholding exceeded 1 lakh rupees. Clear? This is what section 141, subsection 4. So with this successfully, we are done with section 141, which is talking about eligibility, ineligibility criteria. Now, the next set of questions will be regarding procedural formalities, like procedure for appointment, procedure for selection, procedure for removal, all these things will be there. Let us try to have a quick revision of that also. First, we will talk well, First, we will talk about procedure for selection of auditor. Sir, how the auditor will be selected, sir? So, out of so many individual practicing chartered accountants, out of so many audit firms, how the auditor will be selected? To understand this selection process, one of the prerequisites is understanding about audit committee. So, some companies are required to create an audit committee. Audit committee means nothing but a sub-team of board of directors. Sir, which companies are required to create audit committee? So, the applicability criteria is something like this, all listed companies. 
and if it is a public company but not at listed if it satisfies any of these three conditions what are they if they have a paid up capital of 10 crores or more if they have a turnover of 100 crores or more if they have outstanding loans or borrowings or debentures of 50 crores or more if any of this condition is satisfied by a public company then they will constitute audit committee listed company no need to check for any conditions directly audit committee they have to constitute private companies are exempted from audit committee now, what should be the composition of audit committee? Audit committee shall consist a minimum of three directors. How many? Minimum should be three directors. Out of them, majority must be independent directors. In uh, three, what is the majority? Two. All the members of audit committee shall be able to read and understand financial statements. All the members who are there in the audit committee, they should be able to read and understand financial statements. Now, what audit committee will do so? Audit committee will look after all the financial statement and audit related matters. Like specifically, if we see the functions of audit committee, they will involve in the recommendation for appointment, deciding the remuneration, appointment of auditors, etc. They will check whether auditor is independent and whether he is performing effectively or not. They will examine the financial statements and audit report. They will make subsequent modifications and also approval of the related party transactions. They will check intercorporate loans and investments and also they will value the assets, etc. So these are the functions of audit committee. Now, why did we understand about functions of audit committee? Why? Because in the selection process, audit committee is going to play a key role. Now, in order to understand selection process, we will divide the companies into two categories. Those companies in which audit committee is constituted and those companies in which there is no audit committee. So, if audit committee is constituted, what will happen is audit committee will do some analysis and select the auditor. They will do the various analysis like how many number of partners are there, what are their educational qualifications, what is their experience, existing number of partners. So audit committee will do all the analysis. They will select the auditor and recommend the name to board of directors. Now, once the name has been recommended to board of directors, two things can happen. Board of directors may agree with the recommendations of audit committee. Board of directors may not agree with the recommendations of audit committee. If the board of directors agree with the recommendations of audit committee, they will recommend the same name to members or shareholders. They will pass a resolution. Auditor gets appointed. If the board of directors do not agree with the recommendations of audit committee, here the problem arises. The act says then the matter should be referred back to audit committee which means audit committee has selected some auditor recommended the name to board of directors but board of directors are not happy board of directors are saying no no we are not agreeing with this auditor then what they shall do refer back the matter which means ask the audit committee to reassess and suggest some other name now after referring back the matter two things can happen after referring back two things can happen what two things can happen after referring back the matter so after referring back what could happen is Audit committee agree to change the recommendation. Audit committee might do the analysis once again and they might change the recommendation. See, if they change the recommendation, well and good, they will recommend another name to board of directors. They will agree it. Matter gets closed there. This is not a problematic scenario. What is the problematic scenario? Audit committee did not agree to change the recommendation. That means board of directors are saying, sir, we are not happy with your recommendations. Please change it. Audit committee, is, audit committee is saying, no, no, we did correct recommendation only. We will not change our recommendation. Now, if you observe here, there is a deadlock in the management. Board of directors are not ready to agree with the audit committee's recommendation. Audit committee is not ready to change its recommendation. Complete deadlock in the management. Now, someone should be given an upper hand to make to take this matter further. So what act has told is if audit committee deemed agree and the board of directors are not ready to go with the audit committee's recommendations, board of directors have been given superior power. The act told board of directors can ignore audit committee's recommendation and they can select the auditor doing their own analysis and recommend that name to shareholder. But let the shareholder know the fact that being a board of directors, you disagreed with the recommendations of audit committee. Don't just let the shareholder know the fact. Also, let them know the reasons why you have disagreed with the recommendations of audit committee. Now, the shareholder will have recommendation done by board of directors. Along with that, reasons also will be there. Uh, the shareholder will take appropriate decision. So, this is what the process for selection of the auditor. How one individual or audit form will be chosen. And that too, when audit committee is constituted, they will select recommend to board of directors. If they agree, well and good, recommend to shareholders. If they do not agree, refer back the matter. After referring back, if audit committee changes the recommendations, well and good. 
if audit committee didn't change the recommendation then the board of directors can select the auditor recommend the name to shareholders but let them know the fact that they disagreed and also let them know the reasons for the same clear see we have discussed only one case if audit committee is there what if there is no audit committee if audit committee is not there headache itself is not there here what will simply happen is since there is no audit committee board of directors only will do the analysis they will only select the auditor recommend the name to the shareholder matter gets closed audit committee recommending board of directors disagreeing all this headache and issue will not be there board of directors only will simply select the auditor recommend the name to shareholders that's it so simple now let us talk about appointment procedure how the selected auditor will be appointed and for the purpose of appointment procedure the companies are broadly divided into two categories one is government company and the other one is non government company and in each of the company also we have divided auditors into two categories first auditor and subsequent auditor here also first auditor and subsequent auditor first auditor means nothing but the person whoever is getting appointed as auditor for the first financial year subsequent auditor that means after the first financial year for the subsequent years whoever is getting appointed that person we call him as subsequent auditor now talking about government company uh, first we will start with non government company first auditor who will appoint the first auditor in the case of a non government company so in the case of non government company the first auditor appointment power has been given first to board of directors and they shall do it within 30 days from the date of incorporation of the company if company incorporated 30 days is also over but the board of directors did not make an appointment then the power will go to shareholders and they shall do it within next 90 days and that to at an egm extraordinary general meeting that's all board of directors 30 days shareholders within next 90 days at egm if it is a case of government company here the power has been given to cndg within 30 days from the date of incorporation cndg will make an appointment if they sorry within 60 days cndg will make an appointment if they fail the power will go to board of directors and within 30 days they shall do it and one more thing if board of directors also fails then the power will go to shareholders they shall do it within next 60 days at an egm so 60 30 and 60 whereas here board of directors and shareholders 30 and 90 in both the cases tenure is going to be till the conclusion of first agm tenure is till the conclusion of first agm in both the cases in government company as well as non government company so this is what the procedure for appointment of first auditor and one more thing here very important point when i say board of directors will make an appointment how the board of directors will make an appointment will signing of appointment letter by one of the board of director or managing director will it be enough no when we say appointment to be done by board of directors board of directors will conduct a board meeting and in that board meeting resolution will be passed then the auditor will be appointed not just one or two persons signing the appointment letter clear so in the first stage him first auditor's tenure will be over now what about subsequent auditor so now talking about subsequent auditor of a government company the power has been given to c and dg and they shall make an appointment of an auditor within 180 days from the commencement of financial year within how many days within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year c and dg shall make an appointment of a subsequent auditor and tenure will be till the conclusion of next agm after that once again next year will start within 180 days from the commencement of the financial year c and dg will appoint and that subsequent auditor's tenure will be till the conclusion of next agm like this year after year the process will keep on happening now coming to subsequent auditor of a non government company the act has told that the subsequent auditor of a non government company shall be appointed by shareholders at agm and the auditor so appointed will hold the office from the conclusion of first agm till the conclusion of sixth agm which means the subsequent auditor of a non government company will be there in office for either six agms or alternatively we can say the subsequent auditor of a non government company will conduct audit of five financial years clear everybody the subsequent auditor will be appointed in the case of non government company by the shareholders where at the agm and what will be his tenure from that agm in which is in which he is appointed till the conclusion of 6th agm 
which means now once again in the sixth AGM, like if I have to give example, assume that first or uh, subsequent auditor was appointed at first AGM. He'll be there in office till sixth AGM. Now, once again, in the sixth AGM, this subsequent auditor's tenure will be over. Once again, shareholder will appoint subsequent auditor. Now, what will be that subsequent auditor's tenure from this AGM till the conclusion of next sixth AGM? So, like this, subsequent auditor of a non-government company will be there in office for six AGMs, we can say, or alternatively, we can say that he will do the audit of five financial years. Clear? So, this is what the procedure for appointment of subsequent auditor of a non-government company. So, this is what regarding the appointment procedure. That's all so simple. And one more thing here. Before you make any appointment, you need to, the company must obtain written consent of the auditor. Before you perform this appointment procedure, the company should get written consent. What, sir, if we are trying to appoint you as an auditor, in case if you are appointed as an auditor, are you ready and willing to act as an auditor? get the written consent and also auditor should provide some certificate regarding certain matters regarding what things he need to provide certificate that he is eligible for appointment and is not attracting any of the disqualification his appointment will be within the term as provided nothing but rotation concept which you will see later then the proposed appointment is within the limits that limit of 20 and also whether there are any pending cases against the company or sorry, whether there are any pending cases against the firm or partners, that list of pending cases also. So the certificates containing this four matters should be obtained by the company from auditor. Clear for all appointments. And one more thing here, within 15 days of auditor's appointment, the company shall submit one form with ROC. Who has to file? Company has to file one form with ROC, which is form number ADT1 within how many days? Within 15 days of appointment of the auditor, the company should file form number ADT1 with the ROC. So this is what regarding appointment procedures. Now, let us talk about other procedural formalities. How to fill the casual vacancy procedure for filling of casual vacancy. First of all, what is the meaning of casual vacancy? Casual vacancy means a vacancy getting created in the office of the auditor by any reason other than expiry of the term. Which means auditor's tenure has not yet completed, but because of some reasons, the auditor's position has become vacant, which means currently no one is acting as an auditor. If currently no one is acting as an auditor, should that position be left vacant or some measure should be taken to fill that? Definitely some measures has to be taken to fill that. So, how to fill that casual vacancy? Let us try to understand. For the casual vacancy also, we will divide companies into two categories, government company, non-government company. See, if it is a case of government company, whatever may be the reason for casual vacancy, the filling is very simple. First, the power has been given to C and AG. Within 30 days, within 30 days of such casual vacancy, C and AG will fill it. In case if the C and AG fails to do it, then the power will go to board of directors. Within next 30 days, they will do it. That's all. Whatever may be the reason, C and AG will do it within 30 days. Board of, if they fail, the board of directors will do it in next 30 days. Whereas, if it is a case of non-government company, here we need to check the reason. Is it because of resignation or is it because of other than resignation? If it is because of any reason other than resignation, like death, subsequent disqualification, whatever it is, if it is because of any reason other than resignation, the procedure is very simple. Board of directors, within 30 days, they will fill it. Whereas, if it is a case of resignation, here also what will happen is the board of directors will do it within 30 days, but that appointment shall be approved, should be ratified, should be approved by whom? Shareholders. Within what duration? So, within three months from the date of that board's appointment, the appointment shall also be approved by shareholders. Then only the casual vacancy filling will be valid. If it is a government company, no need to check the reason. Whatever could be the reason. Very simple procedure. But this resignation or other than resignation will arise only in the case of non-government company. If it is other than resignation, very simple. Board of directors within 30 days. If it is a case of resignation, board of directors within 30 days. But it shall also be approved by shareholders within three months. Clear? So this is what the procedure for filling of casual vacancy. And one more thing, sir, what is the tenure of the casual vacancy auditor, sir? Till the conclusion of next AGM. Whenever next AGM happens, till the conclusion of next AGM only, the, sub, uh, the casual vacancy auditor's tenure will be there. 
that's all this is what regarding tenure of the casual vacancy auditor till the conclusion of next agm now as a part of this casual vacancy answer we have seen that the auditor can resign from the company but whenever auditor resigns from the company he need to follow some protocol he just cannot keep a whatsapp message to the board of directors from tomorrow i am not coming to the audit he need to follow some formalities what is that formality is from within 30 days of resignation auditor should file form number adt3 within 30 days of resignation auditor should file form number adt3 that to within how many days sir within 30 days they have to file it to whom it has to be filed with the company one copy with the roc one copy with the c and ag in case if it is a government company if it is not a government company only company and roc if it is a government company company roc and c and ag within 30 days auditor has to file this form number adt3 sir what if it does not file sir what will happen what will happen simply penalty will happen so what is the amount of penalty the penalty will be the auditor will be punishable with a fine which shall be minimum 50,000 rupees or auditor's remuneration, whichever is lower. If auditor does not file form 83 within 30 days, he shall be liable with fine and minimum penalty will be either 50,000 or remuneration of the auditor, whichever is less. And not just that, for every day of continuing failure, 500 rupees per day will be added and the maximum penalty can go up to 2 lakh rupees. So, minimum penalty will be either 50,000 rupees or remuneration whichever is less assume that auditor's remuneration is 30,000 50,000 or 30,000 whichever is less whichever is less minimum penalty will be 30,000 but for, for every one day of continuing failure what will happen 500 will be added like if you are filing it on 40th day minimum penalty 30,000 10 days of delay 30 within 30 days you have to file but you are filing within 40 days so 10 days delay 500 into 10 5,000 each he will pay 30,000 so like this for every one day of continuing failure 500 will be added but this can but this uh, maximum penalty cannot go on any higher side there is a maximum limit on penalty like this if you keep on adding 500 rupees per day the maximum penalty it can go up to 2 lakh rupees assume that if you have calculated this maximum penalty at some point of time it was calculated that 250000 penalty amount is coming but auditor is not required to pay 250000 why because the penalty is capped at 2 lakh rupees clear so this is what will happen in case auditor has resigned and failed to file that form number adt3 clear now coming to the next thing like the way auditor can resign before expiry of his term even the management of the company has also been given the power to remove an auditor also but even for removing the auditor also, there is a dedicated procedure which company needs to follow. Now, what is the procedure for removal of an auditor? Let us try to understand it. So, the procedure for removal is something like this. First, it should start with the board of directors conducting a board meeting and in that board meeting, resolution of the board of directors will be required. What resolutions are? Bo uh, board of directors, ordinary resolution will be fine. So, if the company wants to remove an auditor before expiry of the term, first it should start with the board of directors conducting a board meeting and in that board meeting, resolution, which resolution? Ordinary resolution of the board of directors is required. Now, within 30 days of that board resolution, the company should submit a form called form number ADT2 with the central government. For what so asking the approval of the central government for removal of an auditor so board of directors shall conduct a board meeting and in that board meeting ordinary resolution within 30 days of that resolution company will file one form which form form number adt2 with whom central government for what purpose asking the central government to give approval if the central government gives approval within 60 days of receiving the approval company shall conduct one general meeting and in that general meeting special resolution of the shareholders will be required which resolution special resolution so the three people are involved in the removal process of an auditor who are the three people board of directors should conduct a board meeting pass a board resolution uh, and within 30 days application should be submitted to central government and central government also should give approval and within 60 days of receiving the central government's approval general meeting of the shareholders is required 
and in that general meeting special resolution of the shareholders also will be required these three kind of procedures are to be followed and even order also should be same in the same order first first board of directors resolution then central government approval then only shareholders resolution sometimes they might try to give you in the question first board of directors has passed a board resolution shareholders has passed a special resolution then approval of the central government has been obtained is it valid no order also should be same board resolution central government approval after that shareholder special resolution clear so this is what the procedure for removal of auditor by the company and one more thing before removing an auditor an opportunity of being heard also should be given this is very important an opportunity of being heard should be given next even tribunal also can remove the auditor the tribunal has also been given the power to remove an auditor but the power to remove the auditor for that also there is a procedure so how the tribunal can remove the auditor so here also someone should make an application to the tribunal sometimes without any application tribunal on its own can initiate an action or application can be made by central government or any person concerned when i say any person they literally mean any person need not be shareholder need not be debenture holder any even a common person also can make an application so tribunal on its own can initiate an action or a, even an application can be received from central government or any other person concerned so to whom application has to be submitted so to the tribunal only application has to be submitted now what is the procedure for removal so once application has been received by the tribunal tribunal will keep on uh, proceeding with the hearings now after listening to the arguments if the tribunal is satisfied that yes auditor has acted in a fraudulent manner the tribunal will pass an order removing an auditor once the tribunal passes the order the auditor shall stand removed however if the central government made an application the order should come out very quickly tribunal cannot take their own time the tribunal shall pass the order within 15 days when in case application has been submitted by central government and in that case the power to reappoint the auditor also will be given to central government only when when central government gave an application so once again i am telling if the central government makes an application tribunal shall do the faster processing of the case order should come out within 15 days of application and in that case the power to reappoint the auditor will be given to central government only sir what if others made an application sir if others made an application then what will happen is now the tribunal can their can take their own sweet time and can pass an order within their uh, reasonable time and in that case if the auditor is removed then who will appoint the auditor other than application made by central government then it will come under normal casual vacancy related matter normal casual vacancy procedures will become applicable clear so central government will get the power only if central government made an application however there is even one more point see if the court is passing an order the person can't be appointed for 10 years no on the other hand if the order has been passed by tribunal that an auditor has been then that an auditor has been involved in committing a fraud then the person can't act as auditor for 5 years from the date of such conviction how many years guys for 5 years a person can't get appointed as an auditor in case if the conviction is made by tribunal however if the court is passing an order that auditor involved in a fraudulent manner then the uh, then the restriction will be there for 10 years clear everybody so this is what regarding the removal of auditor by the tribunal clear now there is even one general question it was asked in now uh, one of the rtps and also it is there in the study material as i have told you when you are removing the auditor central government's approval is also required no why central government approval is required for removing an auditor why can't the board of directors and shareholders simply remove the auditor this is simply a common sense oriented question the answer you have to write something like this if you are removing the auditor before expiry of the term it is a matter requiring serious attention it is a somewhat uh, severe matter why because you are removing an auditor before his position got before his tenure got over so that's why here there is a possibility of auditors independence getting affected so that's why if you make a application to the central government they will check the reasons and they will decide is the removal of the auditor is valid or not so simply to protect the independence of the auditor central government's permission has been made necessary while removing the auditor clear so that's what one small question will be there that also we have revised so with this we have seen with procedure for selection procedure for appointment procedure for removal removal by auditor removal by tribunal there is even one more procedural formality which we need to understand the important concept which is about rotation of auditors what is that rotation of auditors now what does this rotation of auditors means is 
if an auditor is permitted to continue for any number of years he will become more familiar with the client and that will lead to familiarity threat so that's why in order to break that familiarity thread the act has introduced a concept called rotation which says that after an auditor conducted audit for certain number of years the auditor shall not be appointed once again in the same company so after certain number of years of continuous service the person the same individual or audit firm shall not be permitted to act as an auditor so that concept we call it as what rotation now first let us try to understand applicability sir does auditors of every company are required to be rotated does every company has to follow this rotation concept no rotation concept is applicable only for certain companies what are that companies let us have a look at it so applicability of rotation of auditors it is not applicable for all companies then for which companies all the listed companies rotation concept becomes applicable if you are an unlisted public company if you satisfy any one of these two conditions what are they if they have a paid up capital of 10 crore rupees or more if they have a borrowings from public financial institutions or banks or public deposits of 50 crores or more if any of these two conditions are satisfied by a public unlisted company then also rotation will become applicable for them even rotation concept is applicable for private limited companies also if they satisfy any of these two conditions what are they if they have a paid up capital of 50 crores or more or if they have a borrowings from public financial institutions banks or public deposits of 50 crores or more so only for these companies rotation concept will become applicable however specifically the rotation concept is not applicable for one person company and small companies even it is not applicable for government companies so this is what regarding applicability now let us try to understand what is the manner of rotation after how many number of years the auditor should be changed act says if you are appointing an individual as an auditor an individual can't be appointed for more than one term of five consecutive years an individual can't be appointed for more than one term of five consecutive years if you are appointing an audit firm or llp irrespective of number of partners a firm or llp can't be appointed for more than two terms of five consecutive years sir if an individual completes one term of five consecutive years or if an audit firm completes two terms of five consecutive years or alternatively we can call it as 10 continuous years also so the act is saying an individual can be appointed only for five years a firm can be appointed only for 10 years sir if an individual or audit firm completes their term of one or two terms of five consecutive years can't they get reappointed in the same company throughout the rest of the life no they can get reappointed but subject to a gap of 5 years and this gap of 5 years we call it as cooling period or break in service we call it now what does this rotation concept look like it looks something like something like this if you are appointing an individual he will do the audit for 5 years now for the coming 5 years the same person can't be appointed as an auditor of the company now after this 5 years gap this 5 years gap we call it as break in service or cooling period once this 5 years gap has been given the same individual can be appointed once again for how many years 5 years after that once again a gap of 5 more years then once again 5 more years he can get reappointed after that once again gap of 5 years the same thing happens with audit firm also but instead of 5 years the audit firm can be appointed for 10 years once they complete this 10 years for the coming 5 years they can't get appointed as an auditor once they give the gap of 5 years once again they can they can be appointed for 10 years then once again give the gap of 5 years after that the same firm can be appointed once again for 10 years like this so on and so forward clear so this is what the concept of rotation an individual can be appointed for one term of five consecutive years an audit firm can be appointed for two terms of five consecutive years after that they have to compulsorily undergo a gap of 5 years which we call it as break in service or cooling off period now there are some special points to understand here so what are that special points means so they say that if an incoming auditor and outgoing auditor both are having common partner then even such incoming auditor also cannot be appointed as an auditor so what does that mean so assume there is a company x limited there is a firm abc and co just now they have completed just now they have completed 10 continuous years 
an audit form is there this company x limited to which rotation concept is applicable just now they have completed 10 continuous years of service can they get reappointed once again no for the five years this firm cannot be appointed as an auditor now for this five years this company is looking for appointment of another audit firm pqa and co but the problem is in this outgoing auditor and in this incoming auditor they both are having a common partner mr a incoming auditor and outgoing auditor both are having what a common partner because of this reason not just this audit firm even this audit firm pqa and co also can't be appointed as an auditor so if the incoming auditor or the outgoing auditor both are having a common partner then even such incoming auditor also can't be appointed during that cooling off period of five years clear everybody and not just that there is even one more point so now one more point so even they say one more point further what even they say is if the incoming auditor and the outgoing auditor both are working under same network both are working under what same network then also incoming auditor can't be appointed which means once again let us take an example mr a individual practicing chartered accountant he was conducting audit of the company x limited just now he has completed five years of continuous service can he be reappointed no now this x limited is considering appointing another person mr b but the problem is mr a and mr b both are working under same brand name or they are working under same trade name or they are having one common control so like this if the incoming auditor and the outgoing auditor both are belonging to same network then even such incoming auditor also can't be appointed during that cooling off period of five years clear and what do you mean by firms belonging to same network either they are operating under same brand name or they are operating under same trade name or they are having some kind of common control so then we call them as firms operating under same network so if the incoming auditor and the outgoing auditor both are belonging to same network even such incoming auditor also can't be appointed during that cooling off period of five years and one more last point here is assume there is a company x limited there is a firm abc and co just now they have completed 10 continuous years of service as we know this firm can't be appointed during the coming five years but what has happened here is one of the partner mr a who is a partner in charge and who certified the financial statements resigned from this firm and he joined another firm some pqr and co what is happening here one of the partner who is a partner in charge who is a main partner in the audit firm which has completed 10 years of service in that audit firm the main partner resigned from the outgoing firm and joined another firm even such auditor also can't be appointed during this cooling off period of five years now this point is different from common partner see in the common partner what is happening what is happening is a person is continuing in both the firms but in this point what is happening is one of the partner resigned from this outgoing firm and joined another firm but even in this case also this firm cannot be appointed during this cooling off period of five years but the partner who is resigning and joining other firm should be partner in charge he should be the main partner in the firm so if assume that in this case a is the partner in charge b and c are other partners if they resign and join another firm then there is no restriction then this firm can be appointed restriction is there only for partner in charge if he is resigning and joining another firm then only there will be restriction clear everybody so this is what these are the key concepts regarding this rotation of auditors understood so with this we are done with rotation of auditors also so with this most of the procedural formalities we are done now coming to the next few next few concepts like what are powers and duties of the auditor so talking about rights of the auditor or powers of the auditor as we know company audit is a statutory audit and we even know that in the statutory audit the respective law or regulation itself will decide what are powers of the auditor so the law has given some powers to the auditor let us see what are they number one as you could observe here the auditor will have access to books and documents of the company 
the auditor will have access to books and documents of the company the auditor at all times wherever the books are kept they might be kept at registered office they might be kept at branch office doesn't matter auditor will have access to the books at all times but don't take at all times so literally at all times means working days and business hours only however this right is not just restricted to financial books he can have access to other documents also like statistical books memorandum books or cost records inventory records all this records also he can have access and one more thing in case if you are doing audit of the consolidated financial statements you will not have access only to the holding companies books of accounts you will have access to subsidiary uh, joint ventures and associate companies books also and even though there is a separate branch audit even though there is a separate branch auditor appointed still the principal auditor will have access to branch books of accounts even after having a separate branch auditor also and the auditor cannot auditor's right is not just restricted to having access to books and documents in that books and documents if he needed some extra clarification explanation or if he is having some doubts he is having right to obtain that extra information and explanation from the management or officers or employees of the company so that right to obtain extra information and explanation is also been given and also auditor will have right to receive the notices of every general meeting and even he will have right to attend every general meeting so whenever any general meeting is conducted whether agm or egm whether financial statements are discussed or not discussed all that things doesn't matter auditor will have right to receive general meeting every general meeting he will have a right to receive and in addition to that he will even have right to receive the notices of the general meeting and one more thing it is not just right of the auditor to receive the general meeting why because section 146 clearly says that the auditor shall attend general meeting so we can say that auditor it is both a right as well as duty of the auditor to attend the general meeting clear everyone and apart from that whatever his findings are there he can report that to the members of the company whatever his observations are there whatever his findings are there whatever his opinion is there everything he can express is through his opinion in the form of written audit report and that report should be prepared after taking into account the provisions of this act nothing but companies act and also keeping in mind accounting and auditing standards and finally in this audit report auditor will express opinion regarding what the state of companies affairs nothing but the state of assets and liabilities the profit or loss and also cash flow for the year whether all these are giving true and fair view or not on that he will express his opinion also and one more last right right to lien which means the auditor has right to retain the possession of the client's property for not collection of the fees and which audit property will be there in auditor's possession which client's property will be there in auditor's possession for non payment of the fees generally the client's books of accounts will be there in auditor's possession if the client is not paying you the audit fees the auditor can exercise right of lien over client's books but however even though this right has been given but auditor can't practically exercise it why because section 128 of the companies act says books of accounts must be kept at the registered office so if you want to exercise right of lien you have to move the books of accounts from registered office that itself will lead to violation of the companies act so even though the right of lien has been given to the auditor but it is practically impossible for the auditor to exercise right of lien and also there are some case laws it is very unprofessional for the auditor to exercise right of lien like it is similar to a doctor saying uh, to a patient you are not giving me the fees for this operation i will keep your kidney give me the fees and take back your kidney very unprofessional no somewhat similar to that so even though the right of lien has been given to the auditor but auditor can't practically exercise it because of companies act and also because of some uh, practical case laws and so so these are the powers of the auditor which are given to him under act itself neither management nor shareholders no one can restrict these rights if they want they can extend but no one can restrict these rights and now the act is not just giving rights to the auditor as we all know rights always comes with responsibilities so let us try to understand what are that duties or uh, responsibilities of an auditor so talking about duties of the auditor see we have seen right to report to the members and i will say right to report or reporting to the members is not just a right it is even duty also why because no one will say audit is completed unless and until you give your audit report and it is whose duty to prepare the audit report it is obviously the auditor's duty to prepare the audit report so that's what the first point is that was the first responsibility 
auditor shall prepare a audit report and submit it to members of the company and not just preparing the report alone will be enough auditor should even sign the audit report also why because without auditor's signature the report will not make any sense and it is whose responsibility to sign it it is auditor's responsibility to sign it and whatever audit you are doing that audit you have to do it after complying with the auditing standards you can't do it as per your own wishes so you have to comply with the standards on audit released by the icai and which are prescribed by central government so section 143 subsection and clearly saying it is responsibility of auditor to comply with standards on audit and who will prescribe the standards central government see standard setting procedure is something like this first icai will develop a standard and that developed standard will be given to central government now central government will give it to nfra nfra will review this standard give their recommendations now after considering these recommendations central government will finally prescribe the standards so whatever standards are there which are prescribed all those standards are required to be complied by the auditor while doing audit that is also one of the duty and finally this point we have already seen duty to attend the general meetings auditor will have right as well as duty to attend the general meeting why because section 146 clearly told auditor shall attend general meeting shall means they are making it compulsory so auditor shall attend either by himself or through his authorized representative when i say authorized representative that person also should be qualified to act as an auditor and this right is restricted only to general meetings not board meetings he can go and attend general meetings but he does he cannot go and attend the board meetings also so these are rights and duties of the auditor now we have even one more duty on the auditor to report on fraud so whenever auditor came to know about any fraud happening in the company he needs to do some reporting so how to do that reporting that uh, that has been given under 143 subsection 12 of the companies act and this 143 subsection 12 of the companies act has divided the auditor's responsibilities into two categories what are they the fraud in which amount involved is one crore or more the fraud in which the amount involved is less than a crore and the amount the fraud in which the amount involved is one crore or more their central government reporting will become applicable here there is no central government reporting now what should be the manner of reporting is first the matter should be communicated to audit committee if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors within how many days within two days of knowledge of the fraud here you have to be very specific why because 143 subsection 12 says if audit committee is there the fraud should be communicated to audit committee only if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors don't be of a wrong notion that auditor can choose either audit committee or board of directors no if audit committee is there to the audit committee only if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors so auditor should report the fraud to the audit committee if audit committee is not there to the board of directors within how many days within two days of knowledge of the fraud and give them 45 days of time for getting their replies within two days of communication then give them 45 days of time for reply and within 45 days two things can happen reply is received if reply is received the act says within 15 days of receiving reply within 15 days of receiving reply the matter should be reported to central government by submitting an form form number adt4 and what and all you will send it to central government is the report which we have sent to audit committee or board of directors along with that what replies you have received along with that any remarks of the auditor on that replies all this three will be sent to the central government in which form in form number ADT4 and all this information should, should be sent on letterhead of the auditor nothing but a pre-printed document which contains details of the auditor his address telephone number etc that we call it as letterhead so this information should be printed on letterhead signed by the auditor and even containing the seal of the auditor stamp of the auditor and when i say you have to report it to central government to whom in the central government you will report to the secretary ministry of corporate affairs so within 45 days if reply is received within 15 days of receiving reply report the matter to central government in form number adt4 and what and all you will send report which you have sent to audit committee or board of directors on that what replies you have received and along with that auditors remarks and all this information should be on letterhead of the auditor it should be signed by the auditor it should contain a seal of the auditor and it will be sent to secretary ministry of corporate affairs in case reply is not received then also the act will say report to central government but here the act is silent on time limit 
even if reply is not received within 45 days still you have to report to central government but the act is silent on time limit however you can derive the time limit from other case within 15 days from the expiry of 45 days you have to report to central government like that you can derive not important from examination perspective just remember if reply is not received report here also you have to report to central government here also form number ADT4 only what and all you will send here what I will send is report which I have sent to audit come to your board of directors along with the fact that reply is not received I will even I will mention reply is not received that report along with this fact I will report it to central government in form number ADT4 here also letterhead etc will be there here also secretary ministry of corporate affairs so these are the reporting requirements in case if the amount involved in the fraud is 1 crore or more however if the amount involved in the fraud is less than a crore here central government reporting will not become applicable here what will happen is here also the matter will be communicated with audit committee if it is there if audit committee is not there then to the board of directors within two days what and our auditor what and all auditor will report three things nature of the fraud along with the description what is the approximate amount involved and who are the parties involved with that auditor's responsibility will come to an end but the board of directors will give something called a board's report in that board's report board of directors should give disclosure auditor's responsibility ends here but board of directors when they give the board's report in that board's report board of directors should give some disclosure what disclosures they have to give same about three, three things nature of fraud along with the description amount involved in the fraud parties involved in the fraud along with that what remedial actions are taken auditor reported the fraud no what rectification actions are taken by the management that remedial actions are also required to be reported so these will be the reporting requirements in case amount involved is less than a crore and all these reporting requirements are equally applicable this 143 subsection 12 reporting requirements are equally applicable even for cost auditor and even for secretarial auditor while continuing their respective services clear everybody so this is what regarding reporting requirements under 143 subsection 12 now talking about penalty related provisions this penalty things you can manage sir what will happen in case company or auditor fails to comply with the provisions of companies act very simple if the company is doing any of the non-compliance if the company is not following any of the section 139 to 148 then what will happen is the company will be punishable with a penalty not less than 25,000 rupees but it but it may go up to 5 lakh rupees and every officer who is in default he shall be pen, he shall be facing a penalty of minimum 10,000 rupees which can go up to 1 lakh on company also there will be a penalty on every officer in default also there will be a penalty now what is the punishment for auditor if he fails to comply with the provisions if it is unintentional contravention by mistake if some non-compliance happened minimum penalty 25,000 maximum it can go up to 5 lakh rupees or 4 times of auditor's remuneration whichever is less maximum penalty Whereas if it is intentionally done, if it is intentionally done with a view to cheat shareholder, dimension holder, somebody, then what will happen is in addition to penalty, he has to face imprisonment, not just imprisonment here, penalty also will be very higher. Here penalty will be minimum 50,000, maximum it can go up to 25 lakh rupees or eight times of the remuneration of the auditor. If it is unintentional, 5 lakh or 4 times. If it is intentional, 25 lakhs or 8 times of the auditor's remuneration. Not just that, along with that, you need to refund whatever remuneration you have received. And on, on because of your audit report, if anybody has faced any damages, you have to make good their damages also. You have to compensate for damages also. And in case if audit firm has committed contravention, all the partners will be jointly and severally responsible. Whereas the criminal liability will be there only on concerned partner, whoever committed mistake, like fine and imprisonment is there. Imprisonment has to be faced by only that concerned partner who did the mistake. Whereas fine, whatever fines are there, that is a responsibility of entire firm. All the audit, all the partners will be collectively and jointly responsible. Whereas if it is done only, if it is a imprisonment case, this criminal liability has to be faced only by that partner, whoever has committed mistake. Whereas civil liabilities like fines and penalties have to be faced by the entire firm and all partners jointly and severally. Clear? So this is what regarding provisions of Companies Act relating to audit. However, two concepts are there that also I will try to cover. Sorry, three concepts are there that also I will try to cover quickly. One is branch audit, joint audit, internal audit. Let us now talk about first branch audit. Sir, who can do the audit of the branches? Today, it is very quite common. A, play, a business will be located at uh, one head office and it will have so many branches. Now, who will do the audit of accounts of that branch? Very simple. 
principal auditor himself can do the audit of the branches or another practicing chartered accountant can be appointed as auditor for conducting the audit of accounts of the branch whereas if the branch is located outside india if the branch of the company is located outside india the the accounts of that branch office can be audited either by principal auditor or another practicing chartered accountant in india can go and do the audit of that branch located outside india or even a person who is qualified to act as auditor as per laws of that respective country like indian company is there they are having a branch located in us who can do the audit of that us branch either principal auditor can do or any other practicing chartered accountant from india can go and do or a person who is eligible to act as auditor as per us laws like a local cpa also can do the audit so this is what regarding who can act as a branch auditor now coming to few more things who will appoint the branch auditor generally branch auditors are also appointed by members only however the shareholders if they want they can delegate the power to whom board of directors see appointment of normal auditor can't be delegated but appointment of branch auditor can be delegated to shareholders sorry can be delegated to board of directors by the shareholders power lies with shareholders but if they want they can delegate the power to board of directors also next how the reporting will happen sir how the reporting will happen is branch auditor will do the audit prepare a audit report on the branch that audit report will be sent to principal auditor now principal auditor using his work and also using the branch auditor's work he will form a opinion on the entire company and that principal auditor's report will be circulated to the shareholders so what are reporting requirements the branch auditor will conduct audit prepare a audit report on the branch and that report will be submitted to principal auditor now principal auditor will use his work and also branch auditor's work prepare a report on entire company that report will be circulated to the shareholders that's all and whatever reporting requirements that are applicable for principal auditor all that reporting requirements will be equally applicable for branch auditor also clear so this is what regarding branch audit now talking about joint audit so if you if you try to understand joint audit let me briefly cover this also joint audit means when more than one auditor when i say more than one auditor it could be more than one individual it could be more than one audit firm or it could be a combination of individual or audit firm so when more than one auditor more than one individual or more than one audit firm or more than one individual or audit firm so if they are getting appointed if more than one auditor is getting appointed for the same company for the same financial year and also if they have same scope of work that kind of audit we call it as joint audit if more than one auditor has been appointed for same company for the same financial year and also for having same scope of work then such a kind of audit we call it as what joint audit now why more than one auditor will be appointed why because there are some advantages sir what are that advantages workload of the individual auditor will get reduced and also work will get completed in less time and improving the service improving the quality of the service auditor will get better service and also sharing of expertise since more than one auditor is appointed they can share their expertise there will be even a mutual consultation among the joint auditors and ultimately client will be benefited because of this so because of this reason the joint audits are happening so like reduced workload lower uh, less time audit will get completed better quality of service client will be benefited healthy competition so because of all this advantages joint audit is getting conducted but the joint audit does not come only with advantages along with it it is even bringing disadvantages also like what disadvantages so fees increased cost to the company company has to incur extra cost and when you look it from the auditor's perspective sharing of the fees they have to share the fees with others reduction in the audit fees that is a disadvantages for the auditor and in addition to that even then even they will have disadvantages like lack of coordination they will not coordinate with each other a joint auditor might not coordinate with another person he might not cooperate with another another joint auditor and also they will ignore the areas of common concern some common areas no one will look after they will keep on playing the blame game there and also there will be superiority complexes ego complexes also will be there so joint audit is coming with disadvantages also it is even coming with advantages also but advantages outnumber disadvantages so that's why the companies are preferably going for joint audits now in case if the joint auditors are appointed how the work will happen 
will joint auditors will do the work uh, separate separately like sbi is an example of joint audit 12 audit firms are appointed for conducting audit of sbi does that mean will 12 joint auditors will do audit 12 times separate separately no so when joint auditors are appointed they will divide the work among themselves on what basis the work will be divided so it could be on the basis of items of financial statements like assets liabilities incomes and expenses it could be on the basis of geographical locations it could be on the basis of uh, it could be even on the basis of uh, financial statements sorry items of financial statements over geographical locations over it could be even divided on the basis of period of financial statements it could be even divided on the basis of various businesses also like if you take reliance industries limited one joint auditor is saying i will look after petroleum and telecommunication and the other one is saying i will look after re retail and fashion segments so like this on different basis work can be divided on the basis of items of financial statements geographical locations period of financial statements and even on the basis of businesses also the work can be divided so we have seen how the work will be divided now let us talk about responsibility there will be two kinds of responsibilities one is separate responsibility and the other one is joint responsibility separate responsibility means each joint auditor will be held responsible only for the work which was allocated to him like if joint auditors divided the work on the basis of items of financial statements one joint auditor is looking after incomes and expenses other joint auditor is looking after assets and liabilities a will face the consequences only for any mistake happened in work allocated to him b will face the consequences only for the work which was allocated to him so like this separate responsibility means each joint auditor will be held responsible only for the work which was allocated to them now coming to joint responsibility or combined responsibility which means that all the joint auditors will be collectively held responsible in some matters so what are that cases sir in which all the joint auditors will be held responsible there will be five cases in which all the joint auditors will be held collectively responsible number one if there is any undivided work when some work is not divided and in that work only if something goes wrong who will be held responsible all the joint auditors will be held responsible and not just that decisions which are taken by all the joint auditors if any decisions has been taken by all the joint auditors if something goes wrong in that definition only who will face consequences all the joint auditors not just that matters which are brought to notice of all if some information has been brought to the notice of all the joint auditors and no one has taken an action then also everybody will be held responsible and whether financial statements whether the financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework or not whether audit report has been prepared as per auditing standards or not for these five items who will be held responsible all the joint auditors will be collectively held responsible now talking about reporting requirements how the reporting is going to happen how the reporting will happen means generally all the joint auditors once the work gets completed they will have a discussion they will discuss all their findings they will come to one common uh, they will come to one common opinion and that common opinion will be expressed through a single audit report and that single audit report will be signed by all the joint auditors so how the reporting will happen all the joint auditors will come together have one discussion form one common opinion and this common opinion will be expressed to all the joint auditors by way of a single audit report however what if there is a disagreement what if the joint auditors are disagreeing for example assume there are 12 joint auditors for sbi 11 people are saying unmodified opinion but one joint auditor is saying modified opinion since majority are saying unmodified opinion should he go with the majority no the standard did not say go with the majority the standard what it has told us if there is a difference of opinion the auditor can give separate audit report containing his own opinion so if there is a disagreement of opinion here what will happen is 11 joint auditors will give single audit report which will contain unmodified opinion this one joint auditor will give single audit report which contains a modified opinion sir which report will be circulated to shareholder both the reports will be circulated to shareholders which share which opinion shareholder should rely that is up to shareholders choice that is his headache leave it to him but however our responsibility will come to an end when both the reports are circulated to the shareholder which one he will rely that is shareholder's choice clear everybody and also one more thing the standard has told each joint auditor can rely on the work of another joint auditor without any review no review is required a joint auditor can believe the work of another joint auditor without conducting any review why because the other person is also equally qualified like you So this is what regarding 
joint audit related provisions and whatever we have discussed till now all these things are really all this content has been taken from sa 299 so whatever we have content whatever discussed whatever content we have discussed till now regarding joint audit everything has been given under sa 299 now one more last concept regarding that internal audit let us try to end our revision with that yeah so here we have internal audit so let us try to understand what are the provisions of this internal audit first one meaning what is internal audit so internal audit is also an independent activity it is also an objective assurance in an unbiased manner we try to provide assurance and it is a consulting activity internal audit is a problem solving activity and which is designed to add value and improve an organization's operations if you take normal statutory audit normal statutory auditor has nothing to do with generating the value for the company he will not contribute for improving organization's performance but internal auditor is exclusively appointed not just to, to express an opinion to add value he will find out weakness he will report that to the management and he will not just report to the management he will even give recommendations for improvement recommendations for improvement will never be given by the statutory auditor but internal auditor the definition itself says he has been appointed to add value and even improve organization performance which statutory auditor will never do statutory auditor's objective is what just to express an opinion but internal auditor's objective is what to add value to generate value for the client and applicability to which company's internal audit is becoming applicable for every listed company and if it is a unlisted public company and if it is a unlisted public company they will say if the if it satisfies any of the four conditions which four conditions i will tell you shortcut to remember so four things you remember 25 50 100 200 twice the previous figure so biggest figure is 200 generally biggest figure in the financial statements is turnover if turnover is greater than or equal to 200 crores in the preceding financial year the smallest figure 25 generally it is referring to deposits deposits will be very minimal in value if deposits is greater than or equal to 25 crores then the internal audit becomes applicable then we have 50 100 which is lying in the ratio of 2 is to 1 and we know ideal debt equity ratio is 2 is to 1 debt should be two times of equity so here uh, two two times ratio is 100 that is referring to outstanding borrowings if it is greater than or equal to 100 crores 50 is equity nothing but paid up capital which is greater than or equal to 50 crores that's all so if you are an unlisted public company if you satisfy any of these four conditions what are they outstanding deposits of 25 crores or more and paid up capital of 50 crores or more turnover of 200 crores or more outstanding loans or borrowings of 100 crores or more that's what i have tried to explain here in the form of a shortcut 25 50 100 200 biggest figure turnover smallest figure deposits remaining two items two is to one ratio debt and equity outstanding borrowings and paid up capital that's all so this is for a public company if it is a private company out of this four only we need to check two conditions this last two conditions outstanding borrowings and turnover only if two condi only any of these two conditions get satisfied then private company also internal audit become applicable so out of above four conditions only two here we need to check amounts will be same so what are the two conditions turnover of 200 crores or more outstanding loans or borrowings of 100 crores or more now who can act as an internal auditor so here they are saying any uh, individual partnership firm or even a body corporate also can be appointed as an auditor see a body corporate can't be appointed as a statutory auditor but even body corporate can be appointed as internal auditor so who is eligible to act as an internal auditor let us see a cost account a chartered accountant whether engaged in practice or not a cost accountant whether engaged in practice or not or even any other professional as may be decided by the board a chartered accountant whether he could be in practice or not a cost accountant whether he could be practicing or not not just chartered accountant cost accountant even board of directors can appoint a person of any other profession also to act as an auditor so then why did why they have told chartered accountant cost accountant to avoid our egos from getting hurt that's all so simple so by the end of the day any professional can be appointed by the board of directors to conduct internal audit and who will decide objective and scope so who will decide objective and scope here if audit committee is there audit committee will decide if audit committee is not there board of directors will decide objective and scope of auditor internal auditor companies that doesn't want to interfere in the deciding of objective and scope and one more point internal auditor may be an employee or may not be an employee of the company 
whereas the statutory auditor can never be an employee of a company but they have given that freedom when it comes to internal auditor or internal auditor may be an employee or he may not be an employee of the company clear so this is what the things which i thought of covering in the company audit revision so we have spent somewhere around one and a half hour and this discussion this revision is very worthy it will fetch you minimum of 10 marks in the examination hope this video has helped you out for more uh, such kind of content regarding auditing etc please do subscribe to my channel